You know, as I said in first service, it's very interesting how uh, different music communicates different things culturally. Uh, in Western culture, we're typically sing gospel songs about theology or about the character of God, and that was in the Pilgrim Singer's song as well, but it's also oral stories. And in many cultures, uh, that's how traditions and uh, important things in cultures are passed down, is through song. And scripturally, that's what's happening uh, with that music as well, so that was a blessing. It's also, you know, it's interesting, I saw some of you who I know have Roots in the Islands enjoyed that one. It had a little island flair a little bit, didn't it? <laughs> it was good. So happy Sabbath, and I bring greetings to you from uh, the men's retreat. We had a great weekend last week, last week. God really blessed us. We had a baptism in the cold lake. And uh, it's very well organized. If you've always thought about attending that weekend, I can testify that uh, it's a good weekend. And uh, so well organized, well put together. And, you know, some of you say, Pastor, we miss you when you're gone. Uh, I always benefit from it. You benefit from it, too, because this message came from a thought that came to me as I was presenting there at the men's retreat. So uh, you benefit as well. It gives me a little refreshing talks to people, different faces. And uh, so it's a wonderful opportunity occasionally when I get to go share in other places. So. Uh, it's good to be back, though. The sun is shining. God is good. We haven't seen the sun for like a week. It's nice to see it back out. But uh, I hope you had a good week. And if you didn't, well, this is a good way to end it and start me tomorrow. So we're going to talk about today um, G- about Jesus' baptism. And many sermons, when you hear about the baptism of Jesus, they're merely from the perspective of What is his example for us? So in other words, what do we learn for our lives in the actual events that took place in Jesus' baptism? We're going to look at that. But as with many of the things that we often present, when we present it sort of as a a surface level, we miss the depth and the beauty of what that event in Jesus' life that took place means for us, means for the world, means for even the universe. And so today we are going to, yes, look at the example of Jesus' baptism, the the very simple things on the surface, and we're going to go a little bit deeper and see that Jesus was inaugurating something new when he was baptized. This was something special and something new taking place for the human race, for believers, for the faithful everywhere. So that will be our study today, and if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to say one more prayer before we begin. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his example. Thank you for his goodness. Thank you that he is the way you have chosen for us to understand you. In other words, when we look at him, we see you. We see a loving God, a gracious God, a God who forgives, a God who cares. We thank you, Lord, that he was faithful to make us faithful as well. And we pray that you would bless us now, open our minds, open our hearts to receive your word, free up my mind so that I may share this message in a clear and concise way, we pray. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 13. I hope you don't mind looking at a few passages today. Um, Sometimes I'll share them on the screen. Sometimes we have to make our, our fingers nimble and look through our Bibles uh, electronic versions count too. So if you're on your phone or your, your mobile device, that's okay with me, as long as you're reading the Word and following the sermon study notes. They're on the app. Leave the work behind, right? Leave the other stuff behind. If you're texting your family member to watch the live stream, that's okay too. <laughs> Matthew chapter 3 and verse 13. Very famous passage of Scripture. The baptism of Jesus. The Bible says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be what? Baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him or stop him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. We're going to spend a lot of time on that piece of uh, that phrase in just a few moments. But Then he allowed him. So in other words, John baptized him. 
When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately out of the water, or from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. There's so much here. There's so much here. It doesn't seem like that Jesus is doing this just simply as an example for us to know how to get baptized, does it? There's more happening here. We see the, the central figure of the Holy Spirit. We, heard, we hear the voice of God. We, we're going to delve into that here in just a few moments. And a, a thought that I want to bring to your mind here as, as an introduction is, Romans 6 tells us that baptism is like a rebirth. It says, we're buried with him by baptism into his death, and we arise to new life. I want to ask you the question today, did Jesus need to be born again? Had he sinned? Is there anything that he needed to repent for? No, he hadn't. Otherwise, he would have needed a Savior himself, and that would have messed things up <laughs> quite substantially. He didn't need to repent, but in a way, God needed a rebirth. So put that in the back of your mind, and we'll talk about that a little bit more here in just a moment. But let's look at the surface stuff here, um, because Jesus did give us an example in baptism. So the first thing that we notice is, frankly, just the word baptize itself. The word baptize literally means to immerse, to go under, to plunge under or immerse. And it says here also that Jesus was baptized, and after he was, he immediately came up out of the water. So, baptism is to immerse or plunge under. I've seen some pictures before of John baptizing Jesus, and he's standing in this little trickle of water that's supposed to be the Jordan River, and John has this little basin, and he's pouring it over his head. And in another place of Scripture, it says John baptized where he was baptizing because there was a bunch of water there. There was much water there, the Bible says. So true baptism, biblical baptism, is to immerse or plunge under. And my friends here, I love you. If you come from another faith tradition, you've heard me week after week, pay you a lot of respect, but I need to say this. Sprinkling is not baptizing. It just isn't. Think about it. The very word baptize means to plunge under. So to say that sprinkling is baptizing sort of it defeats the, the definition of the word itself. It's just not baptism. The other piece of this that's important to realize is that Jesus is 30 years old when he's baptized. And I, I'm not saying that everyone needs to be 30 years old when they're baptized at all. Not, not in any way. In fact, you've seen us baptize children five, six, seven, eight years old here. But the important part is, is that Jesus has made a choice for himself here, hasn't he? We're going to look at that choice here a little bit more in just a few minutes. But the fact of the matter is, throughout Scripture, what we see is that if this needs to be done at a time when a person can make a decision for themselves. Because as Paul says, it's, it, it, it is a death to your old life and a resurrection to new life. And it's also a choice to follow Jesus and frankly, very small children, babies can't be baptized. Some of you might be wondering, where did sprinkling come from? Historically, simply it's this, convenience. That's, that's why they started changing the custom it was more convenient to sprinkle people with a little bit of water than it was to get wet. And I'll tell you, it's frantic after I get in the tank. Because <laughs> I run in the back and I'm changing my clothes and it's you know, one of those days where my tie's kind of like this, you know, and before you run up, you make sure you're all put back together, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's a quick change and it's, you're sweating and you're disheveled. But... I would never forsake the true symbol for simple convenience. Because it's so meaningful. It's a death and resurrection. It's new life. It's forgiveness. It's repentance. It's, it's all of these wonderful things. And what a fitting symbol. If you're dying to your old self, you're buried with Him under the water. Like, 
The dead are buried under the ground and you're, you're raised up to new life. What a wonderful and fitting symbol. And frankly, I'll just put this out to you as your friend, not just being disrespectful toward anyone's faith tradition. The baptism of babies or the sprinkling of babies came from the idea that if they were not baptized before they died, they would be sent to purgatory. So, number one, purgatory, I don't find that anywhere in the Bible. Number two, I don't believe we serve a God that would send babies to purgatory or hell or anywhere else simply because their parents didn't subject them to a sprinkling. So, again, not being disrespectful to anyone's faith tradition, um, I love Martin Luther. You've heard me pay great respect to Martin Luther. But that's one of those things that he didn't, he didn't come out of the Catholic Church far enough on. And uh, there were a number of those things, and that's perfectly understandable. <laughs> but when we have the clear Word of God here telling us something different, you know, we're called to, to follow what Jesus tells us to do. And, and by the way, this is symbolic, and why wouldn't we want the fullness of the symbol if we're going to go through with something like baptism? And so it's truly a beautiful experience. Um, and again, in Romans chapter 6, Paul says that, didn't you not know that you have been baptized? You have been baptized? Have been baptized into his death? And you're raised to newness of life in faith and to Jesus Christ. And so what we see here is that this is a wonderful, wonderful gift from God. But there's more to it than this. There's more to it than just we, what we learn on the surface from what we see just uh, from the experience of baptism and what Jesus did. There's much more to it. So if we go back here to Matthew chapter 3, um, what we see here is something also that we really need to bring out. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16. Let's look now at how central the figure of the Holy Spirit is. Verse 16. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately out of the water, or from the water, and behold, the heavens were what? Open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So the Holy Spirit comes down, and I've seen this depicted, and I, I tend to believe in this image, the dove landing on the head of Jesus. Because, let's face it, Jesus was called the Messiah. Isn't that true? He's called the Christ. Does anyone know what that word actually means? Someone asks you, what does Messiah mean? What would you say? The anointed one, the chosen one, the anointed one. So Mashiach means anointed. I, I love it on uh, things like the History Channel, some documentaries. The people that they get to, <laughs> to talk about the Bible on some of these documentaries, they find the, the, the biggest knuckleheads you can possibly find. It's like, where, did, where are you getting this stuff? You know, they often bring doubt and things to Scripture. But many of them will refer to Jesus Christ as if Christ is his last name. You know, Jesus Christ did this and this and this. Well, when you say Jesus Christ, Christ literally means the anointed one of God. So when they say Jesus Christ, they say, thank you very much. That's exactly what he is. He's the anointed one of God. He's the Messiah. Amen. But he's being anointed here. And what I want you to realize is, is there a, a true high priest by which all other high priests were a symbol of in the Old Testament? Jesus Christ, amen? Now, when they began their ministry as priests, as high priests, they were anointed with oil, and that oil was a symbol of what? The Holy Spirit. So at Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit, not the symbol anymore, but the, the Holy Spirit physically descends and anoints Jesus for ministry as the Messiah. Amen? We're going to get back to this because it's really important when it plays into our lives. But what was he being anointed for? We need to ask ourselves that question. Go over with me to the Gospel of John and let's see his account of the baptism of Jesus. He has a little more to say about John the Baptist and what John the Baptist said about this experience. So John chapter 1 and verse 29. When you find that, say amen. John chapter 21 and verse John chapter 1 and verse 29. 
John chapter 1 and verse 29. Verse 29 says, The next day John saw Jesus, this being John the Baptist, coming toward him and said what? Behold the Lamb of God who does what? Takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me. Remember, there are a lot of people saying that they thought John was the Messiah. Or John was Elijah resurrected. Or John was something more than what he was. He says, no, I'm just the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He realized his important central uh, purpose there. And Isaiah talks about there would be one that would come that prepare the way of the Lord. He realized that that was his, his gift and his calling. But he says, someone else after me is coming along. Even greater than me. And he goes on in verse 31. I did not know him but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a what? Dove and remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said unto me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the what? The Holy Spirit. So you see something here. Christian baptism is different than John the Baptist's baptism. Did you see that? It said, I come baptizing for one purpose. Someone else is coming baptizing with the Holy Spirit. So Christian baptism is something, there's an added dimension to Christian baptism that John's baptism did not include. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we we go along. And we look to Jesus' baptism to find out what that added purpose is. So why was it important that God opened the windows of heaven and His voice could be heard and the Holy Spirit descended on Him? What was He being anointed for? Well, He was being anointed to be the example, the embodiment of who God is. He was being anointed as the one that the whole world could look at and say, ah, that's what God is like. This was prophesied so many times in the Old Testament. Let's give you an example. Let's go back to our Scripture reading there in Isaiah chapter 11. This speaks to who and what this Messiah would do and and what He would represent. So Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. When we read this passage, we need to be confronted with the fact that Ancient Israel, or even first century Israel, when they read this passage, they were thinking about themselves. Who were they thinking about? Themselves. Themselves. They thought that their righteousness and their obedience would be the example to the world that would show God, show who God really is. Did they fulfill that purpose? And I would even go so far as to say, was that really even what God intended for them? No, what God always intended was to send His Son who would be the one that would show forth the character of God. There's a little bit deeper study to look at there. Are you all warm or are you okay? Okay, don't don't get sleepy on me. So let's read Isaiah chapter 11. It says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. What will he do? Here it is. Why, why were Matthew and John so specific about the Holy Spirit resting on Jesus? Look, it says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon Him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. What will He do? He will delight in the fear, the fear of the respect of the Lord, and He shall not judge by the sight of His eyes, nor decide by the hearing of His ears. He will rule according to the will of God, not by what his senses tell him, not by the panic of the world around, not through selfishness, not through anything else. He will rule through faithfulness to the Father. That's what this passage is saying. It says, His delight is in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Isn't that good news? God was sending one who could truly bring justice, who could truly bring mercy, 
who could truly heal the needs of the poor, who could really live out God's promises. Israel somehow began to believe that that was them, that their nation could do this. And sadly, because of that mindset, it led them further and further away from who God really was. And so God chooses to send his son. Now let me ask you this question. Thinking about the mindset of Israel, how they got off track, thinking about first century Israel, let me paint the picture. Saul, who later became Paul, was one of the major religious leaders of the day. Okay. What did he start doing in the name of God? He started persecuting and even murdering Christians. Now, in his mind, he thought that it was his job to keep Israel so pure that, they, that God would finally see their purity and make good on his promises. So much so that with this in mind, he believed that you could justify murder in the name of God. Now, let me ask you this question. Did Saul really believe in God, yes or no? Did Saul really believe in God? Saul, did he believe in God? Not any God that I know of. Because the true God does not have the kind of character that would justify murder. You can believe in a God that doesn't exist. There are people all around us hating God. The problem is that the God that they hate doesn't even exist. Saul didn't believe. He believed in tradition. He believed in orthodoxy. He believed that his people would save the world. That was never God's plan. His son would save the world. The people wouldn't show forth the glory of God. Jesus would. Saul didn't believe because he didn't believe the gospel. He believed in self, self-made righteousness. He believed in a character of God that did not exist. So let me ask you this question. Did God, in a sense, need a rebirth at the time of Jesus? Some of you said yes. Why is the answer yes? Because the God that people believed in, the God that people would, that even believed that who Jesus would come to represent, wasn't the true God. The people needed to see that God was being given a rebirth. Not that God had anything to repent of. Not that God had done anything wrong, although in later, earlier in Genesis he says, I repent of the fact that I even made man. Another topic. But the fact of the matter is, God needed to be born again in the minds of people. Because the God that his own people believed in didn't even exist. That's why Jesus says, look, I could perform all these miracles in your eyes and you still wouldn't believe. Because you the God that you think I'm representing isn't the true God. You have to think of it also in this way. God had made all these promises in the Old Testament. He said he would make the earth new. Had the earth been made new yet at the time of Jesus? No. He said, I will make Israel the head and not the tail. In other words, first and not last. Did that happen? No, they were still slaves to the Romans and the bondage to the Romans. God said, you know, I, I, will, I, will, I will do all these wonderful things for you and, and to the world. And none of it had happened in the minds of so many people. And even to this day, in the minds of so many people, God seemed like he was unjust, like he was a liar, like he didn't keep his word, like he was unrighteous. So God says, I'm going to put all my eggs in one basket. If you come from a, a, a different background, or an interesting background, you might say, God put all his cards on the table. In Jesus Christ. So he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I want the thoughts of who God is to die 
and I want you to see a new God, a, a new conception of who I am, because the old ones were incorrect. I want you to see without a shadow of a doubt that I am righteous, that I am holy, that I do keep my word, that I'm not a God that's exacting and harsh and wants to kill sinners. I'm not the kind of God that you need to obey out of fear. I'm a God of love and peace and hope and joy and mercy. And he says, here's my son. He'll show you all of this. And that's why Jesus is anointed. That's why he's baptized and the Holy Spirit comes on him. Because he would be the son that would show the world that God really is righteous. God really is holy. And Paul says this exact thing in Romans. And go to Romans 3 with me. So often what we misunderstand in Romans, we read Romans as if it's all about us. So in other words, God is this angry God who wants to kill sinners. And the only reason that God loves us is because of Jesus. So when we read about the righteousness of God, justification, we automatically read ourselves into that passage. But the message of Romans is this, that Jesus is the righteousness of God. You know that God is just, you know that God is righteous, you know that God tells the truth when you look at Jesus Christ. So faith and belief in Christ convinces you that God keeps His Word. And when that happens, we are transformed. Because just like God said with Abraham, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Amen? If we're not being transformed, if, 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 like Saul, Saul wasn't transformed because he didn't believe God. And so God puts forth His Son and says, look, you can believe me. Let me show you in flesh and blood and action and word and deed. You can believe me. Look at Jesus. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Here He is. And that's what the message of Romans and much of Paul's letters are about. I want you to see this. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 21. Have you got it? It says, but now our righteousness. Is that what it says? The righteousness of God. This passage is about God first, not us. So in other words, Paul is telling us how the God is righteous, how we can know that God is righteous. That's what he's talking about in this passage. He says, apart from the law, now make a little note in your Bible, circle that L. Because that L is lowercase. Do you see that? And what he's referring to here is, number one, all the extraneous laws that Israel had put around the Torah. So in other words, if you walk so far on the Sabbath, you're not a true Israelite. If you're not circumcised, you're not a true Israelite. If you have a pebble in your shoe and you still walk the correct distance, but if there's a big enough rock in your shoe, you're not a true Israelite. They thought that their righteousness was through the works and the deeds of their culture. And then he goes on to say something really confusing, because first he said, the righteousness of God is revealed apart from the law, but keep reading, it says, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. What? What? First you told me that it was apart from the law, but then you say that God's righteousness is witnessed by the law. That doesn't make sense. Until you realize that that second L is uppercase. And that second L is referring to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, including the Ten Commandments. Now, I will submit to you, if you don't understand what I'm saying, just put this in your pocket for another time. I will submit to you that God could be referring, or Paul could even be referring, to the Torah and the Ten Commandments with that first lowercase l. Not because there was anything wrong with the Torah or anything wrong with the Ten Commandments, but because of the way that people thought about it. So in other words, there's this law that you all came up with that isn't the law. Are you with me? Yes. There's this tradition that's, that's, that you read in the Bible, but it's not the true tradition. So what he's saying is that the law, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and the prophets testify to the fact that God is righteous. 
But you all don't believe Him because you believe in a different God. You, you, your conception of God is all wrong. You're doubting Him. You're, you're thinking of Him as a liar. And by your works, you think that He can't act to save. He can't act to make good on His promises. Now look at what He goes on to say. Even the righteousness of God through what? Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. And it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, he says. What is he saying here? This is it. You know that God tells the truth and can be believed when you look at Jesus Christ. That's, this whole, that's what this whole passage is about. And much of the book of Romans, he's saying that Jesus is the promises of God. That you know that God is reliable. You know that God can be believed, not because He says so, not because it's some mystical idea, but because Jesus in flesh and blood walked this earth. Somebody say amen. Because friends, that means we don't just believe in mumbo jumbo. Christianity isn't simply about believing in myths and legends and ideas. Christianity is about a person. It's about flesh and blood. And as he says in 1 John, we heard Him. We touched Him. We saw Him. We listened to Him. It's not about some newfangled theology or spiritualism or, or ideas. It's about a person. You know that God can be believed because of His Son. You know that all of the promises of God will come true because of Jesus. And that's what he says. All the promises of God in Christ are yes and amen. But people say, wait a second. It talks a little bit about our righteousness and the righteousness of Gentiles and Jews together. Think about it. What did it say about Abraham? Abraham believed God. And it was accounted to him as righteousness. That's what Paul's saying right here too. If you believe in Jesus you know that you can believe God. You can believe in His promises. You can believe what He said will come true. You can believe Him, and Jesus convinces us that that's true. And when you believe in God, you're transformed. Believe in anything else, you won't be. Believe in God through Jesus, you will be. So God, in a sense, not because of anything God had done, but because of the minds of the people, God needed a rebirth in the eyes of the people. And so Jesus goes down under that water and He rises again and the Holy Spirit says, I'm alighting on you, I'm anointing you for ministry. And God says, this is my beloved Son, pay attention to Him. You remember that experience in the transfiguration with Peter and Elijah and Moses? And, and Peter treated Jesus just like Moses and Elijah. He said, let's make three tents. And the father's like, hang on a second. All three of them are not equal. Don't put my son in the same kind of tent as you put Moses and Elijah in. He stands different. He's set, he's set apart. He's special. He is my billboard. He is my commercial. He is me embodied better than a billboard or a commercial. But I'm trying to give you the illustration that God showed that His character is just and holy and loving and good and reliable in Jesus Christ. That's why He's the Anointed One. That's why He's the Chosen One. That's why He's the Messiah. That's why He's the Christ. So glad that I don't have to just simply believe in ideas or thoughts or concoctions. I believe in a person. And there, there is no one that denies how good Jesus was. There's deniers that say, oh, you know, he was this really nice person. He taught a lot of wonderful things. And you know, he did a lot of great, good things. Well, think about this. He claimed to be God. You do a lot of nice things, but claim to be God, and you're still nuts. There's no middle ground. If somebody walks in here and claims to be God, either they are or they aren't. And if they aren't, they're lying or they're crazy. Maybe they're the devil. Who knows? But there's no middle ground. You can't just be a nice person and claim to be God. 
you're, you're all one thing or you're all another thing. So, God clearly communicates his pleasure in Jesus, in whom I am well pleased, he says. Now, what is the righteousness that he would fulfill? That very thing that God was putting him forward as an example of his righteousness. I want to show you a prophecy in the book of Daniel. Go with me to Daniel chapter 9. I think we've gotten the point here, but when God talks about his promises or his covenant, um, he speaks in, in different language than he does in Daniel 9. When he gives it to Abraham, he says, I'm going to establish or affirm my covenant. When he gives it to Noah, he says, I'm going to establish or affirm my covenant. In other words, I'm going to show myself through things that I do through you. But he says something different about the Messiah in Daniel chapter 9. And it's really wonderful. Um, Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse 24. And by the way, some of you will be confused by a little bit of this language, but this is a prophecy given to the biblical prophet Daniel hundreds of years before Jesus ever lived. And there's a wonderful timeline in your study guide and your self-view app to show you how this prophecy plays out. But notice what it says. Seventy weeks, and in Bible prophecy, a day equals a year. A week would be, or a week would be seven days. Okay? So you can do the math, figure that out when you, on your own time. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and your holy city and to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, to anoint the most holy. Some of you are going, whoa, what does all that mean? Here it is in a nutshell. Got it? For you to understand the purpose of your religion. But that, that's what he's saying. For you to finally get all these promises in the sanctuary and the, the pillar of fire and the cloud and, and the manna that fell and how I've taken care of you and I delivered you through the judges. That's what this prophecy is saying. You have 490 years to figure out the purpose of all the blessings I've ever given you. Why? Because in 483 years, the anointed one is coming. And if you understand the purpose for all the things that I've ever done for you, you will recognize my anointed one. That's what he's about to say. So go, it goes on, it says in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, the anointed one, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So in other words, there will be 69 weeks. You have 490 years to figure this out. And seven years before the 490 years comes along, Messiah will be anointed to show you who I really am. And guess what? Jesus was baptized right on time. And God pushes him forward into the forefront. So here's the point of all this. The 70 weeks was about to expire right on time. How do we know that it happened on time? Think about this. If you read Matthew and John, there are seven points, seven literal points, historical references to tell you exactly when Jesus was baptized. I didn't have time to get through them all today. But basically, in the, in the seventh year of Tiberius Caesar in the province of so-and-so, and its governor was so-and-so, and this happened over here on this. Seven points of historical reference so you know exactly when Jesus was baptized. And it's precisely when this prophecy in Daniel said that you would be anointed as Messiah. Right on time, when God needed a rebirth because he was dead in the minds of so many people, God says, I will anoint my son to be the example. Now, here's the amazing thing of baptism. This is when we trans transfer this to us now. Jesus was also acknowledging and accepting this role by being baptized. God had chosen him, yes, amen? But also Jesus chose to receive it. The, the book Desire of Ages beautifully illustrates that when he was 12 years old, he went into the temple for Passover and he see, saw the sacrifice of these lambs. And something in his heart and his mind from what his mother had told him, the Spirit was moving upon him, made him look at one of those lambs being sacrificed and said, that's me. That's me. And as I've said to some of our homeschoolers before, you know, Jesus is the, is the model for a, a successful homeschool because he learned this from his mom. <laughs> but also, you think about this, 
when it was time for him to receive it, what was he doing from the time he was 12 years old and realized that lamb was him to the time he was baptized at age 30? He was a carpenter. Can you imagine him putting together those tables and those chairs in that workshop thinking, how am I going to convey this to these people? How am I going to say this? What will be my first words when I come on the scene? So maybe the, the best preparation for a Christian is carpentry. I don't know. I can tell you from the fact, just a little bit that, I, you know, put together an IKEA project once. You learn how much patience you need when you do that type of work. And that's not even carpentry. That's just following directions. But Jesus is also accepting this role to be the embodiment of the righteousness of God to the world, so the world can believe in who God really is. It's truly amazing. And so that's why we don't take baptism lightly, do we? We look at the example of Jesus and we realize two things. We realize that as Paul says, yes, it's, it's death to our old life and it's resurrection to our new life. Absolutely true. But there's something more to this. And I would submit to you that even more so than the death and resurrection, it's also that you're being anointed and, dare I say, ordained for ministry. The, the beautiful thing about this, and some of our own kids are mixed up with this idea that when you're baptized, you have to be perfect. God never says that. He says, yes, we're we're, um, you know, we're starting a new life, and yeah, you don't want to take the sins of before through the baptismal font with you to, you know, the, your next life. But it never says you have to be perfect. Somehow we've gotten through our minds that you've got this Christian checklist, and when you've got all the boxes checked, you've graduated, and now you can be baptized. Baptism isn't a graduation. God forbid we ever make it that, because I submit to you, if you believe that it is, you believe in John's baptism. You don't believe in Jesus' baptism. Because Jesus' baptism is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And yes, baptism is about repentance. Baptism is about new life. But even more so, it's an acknowledgement like Jesus that I'm going to go forth to this world as a witness to who He is. And so, yes, there's an acknowledgement. I don't want to live a life of sin anymore. I want to live as a witness to God. But the fact of the matter is, it's an anointing. It's not, it's not a graduation. It's a rebirth. And these are babies unto God. And it's our job as members to disciple them and show them how to be witnesses. It's an anointing for service. It's not a graduation. The other part of this is, too, my friends, Christian baptism, as I said, is an ordination for witness. Think about this. That means as long as you are baptized, you never age out of ministry. If there is ever a point where you say, I'm to this or to that to be a witness for Jesus, chances are you may need to be rebaptized. There is no expiration date on your anointing for ministry. Yes, roles change. Yes, sometimes other people need to step into things. But you are not ever allowed, if you've been baptized into Christ, to stop being a minister for Him. Because baptism isn't graduation. Baptism is anointing. And the moment we forget that is the moment we go back into John's baptism. Let me show you this from Scripture as we're drawing to a close. Go to Acts chapter 19 with me. Acts chapter 19 and verse 1. By the way, in that prophecy of Daniel, it says that Jesus would confirm the covenant. I referred to that earlier, how God said that He would establish or affirm the covenant with Abraham. And He would establish and affirm the covenant with Noah. But when He's referring to Jesus, He says He will confirm the covenant. So in other words, everything that Noah and Moses were pointing toward Jesus confirmed in flesh and blood. 
So Acts chapter 19, speaking exactly like we've been speaking here, look at chapter 19 and verse 1. It says, And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. There's a reason why when people are baptized here at Southview, we surround them and lay hands on them. Because we believe in Jesus' baptism. We don't simply believe in John's baptism. Because baptism is an ordination or witness and service to God for ministry. You see, if you only believe that baptism is about repentance, that's John's baptism. When you're baptized, you become a minister. And I want to submit something to you here. And I know I'm stepping on toes. I stepped on Lutheran and Catholic toes earlier. I'm going to step on some Adventist toes right now. The baptism of Jesus replaced the ordination of the, of the priesthood in the Old Testament. He was anointed for ministry. So that means that those of us who are baptized into Jesus Christ's baptism are ordained for ministry. There is no need for the priesthood and that system that was set up in the Old Testament anymore under the baptism of Christ. All believers are ordained. And here's what ordination essentially is in the church. It's men acknowledging ministry. When I lay hands on someone, I'm not more holy than someone else. It's just me acknowledging what God has already given. Think about that. Chew on that. You don't always have to agree with me. But the fact of the matter is, there is no need for the ordination of the priesthood from the Old Testament anymore. Jesus, here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Okay. Think about this. Chew on it. You don't agree with me. You don't agree with me. Think about this. If when we are baptized, we receive the Holy Spirit and are anointed for ministry, if you don't believe in the ordination of women, you shouldn't believe in the baptism of women. Show me. Show, disprove that to me. Because if you're baptized and you receive and are anointed by the Holy Spirit at baptism, what's the difference when, when humans acknowledge what's happened at your baptism? Enough said. Again, I'm not trying to pick fights. I just want you to think through some of these things. So in, in Acts chapter 19 though, so... The, the, the Spirit here is central to baptism. The gift of the Spirit is central to baptism. So what we see here is that these believers hadn't even heard of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul's like, what, what were you baptized into? Verse 4, Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him, who would come after him, that is Jesus Christ. So in other words, okay, we have a John just came along to tell people about Jesus. And Jesus said there was something more to, the, to, to belief in him. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues. So in other words, they were gifted for ministry, amen? The Holy Spirit anointed them like the Holy Spirit anointed Jesus at his baptism. So, regardless of what you believe about how, who the church should acknowledge in ministry, what we all have to acknowledge together here is that when you are baptized, it's not just a baptism of, re of repentance and graduation from, from old choices. That's part of it. But the other major and beautiful part is that you are anointed for service. Some of us, I think, maybe have forgotten that. Some of us have gotten away from that. And we have done a disservice in the church to people when we make baptism simply about repentance. It's also anointing for witness and ministry. So I want to put this appeal out to you. Some of you have come here and you've learned different things. I said I stepped on a number of different toes here, not because I don't like you, but just simply because I like to make you think and study more. 
The fact of the matter is, some of you came here and you realized, you know, I, I've never been baptized like Jesus was. So maybe your heart was convicted, hey, look, I, I need to die to that die to that old life and be raised to a new life in Jesus and also be anointed as a witness for him. That's what I want for my life. I'm not going to make an altar call here today, but I'm going to ask that you come and talk to myself or one of the elders. Because baptism is central, central to your walk with Christ. Some of you here have been baptized before, but maybe number one, you never realized, wait, this was, you know, it was an anointing for service and witness. And others of you were baptized and you totally walked away from God and you turned your back on Him. You said, wait a second, I need to restart. I need to start over. I need to be rebaptized. I want to talk to you too, so come talk to me. And there's others of you here who, who have been reconvinced or convinced again or reminded that when I was baptized, this is about being a part of ministry. This is about witnessing for Jesus. This is about being part an active part of my church. And you want to reclaim that in your life. I want to make the appeal to you to get involved in what God is doing here in your community. You don't have to be nominated by the nominating committee to be part of. You don't have to be an elder. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have. But you're called as a minister of the gospel when you are baptized, when you become a believer. There is no pew warming in true Christianity. We're called to be involved in ministry and anointed for ministry. So I want to make an appeal to all of you who have made that commitment to, to re remember that you've been gifted with the Holy Spirit in service and in ministry to this world. Maybe it's in the church, maybe it's outside this church. Reclaim that in your life. Most of all, I'm so thankful for Jesus because He is what convinces me that God is who He says He is. That God can be trusted. And that belief transforms me. God's only asking us to take Him at His word. Isn't that amazing? But boy, we make a lot of decisions that go contrary to that. I want to believe God with my whole heart, my whole mind. that goes for you too. We can all agree on a few points. And number one is that your son is the testimony and the witness. The flesh and blood that makes us believe that you can be trusted. That we can take you at your word. And that faith, that belief proves to us and changes us into who you are. Thank you, Lord. And because of that belief, Lord, you have called us to be baptized, to go down into that watery grave and come up a new creation as the baptism of John showed us and as the baptism of Jesus showed us, Lord. Our third point that we can all agree on is that the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus like He descends on us at our baptism. Because we believe and because we take You at Your Word, you anoint us for ministry in your church, outside your church. We are called and anointed to be a witness for you. And so, Lord, those of us maybe that have gotten away from that, may we reclaim that ministry wherever you called us, whatever you've called us to. Lord, may we be inspired to the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, for those of us maybe that have wandered away from you and turned our back on you, I pray, Lord, that you would convict our heart that it's time to come back home through re-baptism or through re-engaging with the church. And for those of us, Lord, that realize we've never made that central commitment, Father, impress upon us to be baptized, to die to our old life, to come up anew as a minister of the gospel. Thank you, Lord. Please, Lord, help us to remember that it's faith that transforms. 
and transforms us to be like Christ and may we be, be a witness to this world of what belief in him thank you Lord for your goodness and mercy in Jesus name